is uh, three or four things. Um, first of all, we're going to talk about getting colors that match because um, there's a science to it. So you don't, it's not simply personal opinion. There's a science that you can do it. And for those of you who are uncomfortable saying, well, I don't know what kind of color combinations are going to work, we can actually, um, we can actually um, give you some rules to go by. So that's one thing we're going to do. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, more things that you can do with CSS. And then we're going to get into images, that is adding images, using them for backgrounds. So, um, I kind of, I kind of like the 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 no lights on. I it kind of looks. Uh, I'm looking at myself in the back. It kind of looks like this is like, you know, like an Alfred Hitchcock thing or something. It's like, <laughs> good evening. Today we are going to. All right. At any rate, to bring us up to speed to where we were before, um, we did a little website for the Cleveland Browns, and it had set of four pages that were linked together, a home page, a Steelers for the first, representing the first three games. All right. And if you recall, <coughs> what we did with this is we created an external style sheet. And the idea of an external style sheet is that we separate our HTML code from our CSS code. And the benefit of that is that we can then apply the same CSS file to a bunch of different HTML pages. That makes it real easy to change because we only need to change it in one place to change it everywhere. So notice that there's no style code here. There's no style tag like we've seen in previous examples. Instead, there's a link tag that says, I have a link. It's a text slash CSS file. It is a style sheet, and the href, that is the file name associated with this, is style.css. Again, the assumption here is that everything is in the same folder, so I just need to give the name of the file. As I said before, though, we want to display file extensions so that we can see the precise name of the file. And sure enough, there is style.css. And as we click around from page to page, every page has the same look. And granted, I'm not doing tons on this one. But if I wanted to change it, let's say, for example, I wanted to make and again, for some of these examples, I may not um, follow the Brown's actual color scheme just for demonstration purposes. But if I want to make the um, header um, be um, the H1 tags be red background and a color of the text of white, I can do this. Notice that when we do put our, <coughs> excuse me, our style code in an external file, we don't need the style tag because it already knows that we're talking CSS here. <coughs> so I go and save that, and now not just one page gets it, but all the pages get it. So with one swipe of the pen, so to speak, we can change the entire site. And that's a good thing, right? We talked about the graph, about how typically it, it takes more to change a site, and it's more expensive, and it's more time consuming than, it, than if you detect the problem earlier. Well, we just made it easier to change it, a little bit easier to change it. All right, now what about getting a color scheme? Because it's possible, you know, let's go in and let's add H2, and we'll say background orange color black. Yeah, I don't know if those really go well together. I guess they don't look too bad. 
But instead of using our own judgment, we can go and we can find a number of, and there might be one in the resource files in Angel, <coughs> but we can find uh, an HTML color picker. <coughs> And the difference between this, that's not the one I want. I'm going to type in color scheme instead. Yeah, there we go. All right, well, boy, it's our, my lucky day. It's already on the oranges. What this does is this uses the, the science of, I guess this would be optics, to pick colors that are complementary. So I can start out by picking the general shade that I want. <coughs> so let's say I wanted a blue shade. It gives me four colors that go together. Green gives me four greens. Red orange, and so on. I can also pick different styles of color schemes. For example, this is monochromatic, which means that all the colors it's giving me are basically just different shades of the same color. But I can also pick what are called contrasting colors. Or I can pick what's called a triad, or a tetrad, or analogic. We're going to keep it simple though and go with um, go with um, oops, my, uh, monochromatic scheme. And we'll go with this one. All right. Now notice it gives us <coughs> four colors. Is four colors going to be enough Bar page. Uh, in a lot of occasions, yes, it will be. All right. One thing that we want to do is we want to avoid overkill. All right. Keep in mind what we're using colors for. We're using colors to make our page look good. All right. We're also using colors to indicate some special meaning to the users. So for example, we use colors to group things together, emphasize things, and if you use too many colors, you lose that effect, right? If everything on the page is one color, and there's one thing on the page that's a different color, wow, that's really going to stand out. There's something special about that section of the page, right? If we have 47 colors on our page and there's each, you know, there, there's 47 things that are a different color than the rest of the page, uh, you kind of lose that effect of standing out. All right, so you want to be very judicious about your use of color. You want to use it, but you want to use it in a way that really emphasizes your content and complements your content. <coughs> in addition, keep in mind that you can always use white, black, and any of the gray shades. Um, in, in, uh, in, uh, in there as well. So I would have these four colors and I'd throw white and black in there and that gives, us, give me, gives me a total of six. And that's probably enough um, for our purposes. So what I can do is it shows me the colors here. So I'm going to start out and I'm going to copy this. And I'm going to make the body of the page the lightest one. So I'm going to go in I'm going to say body, background, that. I'm going to go in and make the header this color. Let me get rid of these for now. We might come back and put those in. Um, then my navigation section, I will make 
and again, I'm just, I'm just picking these just to, to demonstrate. We'll see how it actually looks when I'm done. So I use three of these. Keep in mind, again, this is a simple page. So I'll go and save it. And now when we go and look at this, There we go. And something isn't right. Because, oh, I'm viewing this in Internet Explorer. Remember, we talked about that. So I'm going to view it instead in Google Chrome. And there we have it. All right. And again, we can go in and we can adjust those. The idea is those that we're not using too many colors. Now, one thing kind of stands out to me, all right? The fact that the links are not really fitting our color scheme. And they're, they're in fact, a little hard to read. Remember, <clears throat> the way your page looks depends on two things. One of the things is the CSS code that you put in. The other thing is, is default behavior of the browser. So I didn't say anything about links, so I'm getting the default behavior of the browser. So I could make the links I'm going to make them a little bigger than normal text. How do I do that? There's a font size attribute. One point two M. There's a number of different ways. <coughs> excuse me. There's a number of different ways that you can specify the font size. One point two M means one point two times the normal size. So one point two M is like twenty percent bigger. So this will make it a little bigger. So 1M would be like the normal size. means it's, it's just emphasized a normal amount. 0.8M would be a little smaller than normal. And then anything bigger than 1 would be bigger than normal. So I can go and do this, and now the links look like that. Now, I can also go in and specify a font family. And I can specify Arial, Helvetica, Sun, Serif. And we'll talk more about this later on. But I give a list of fonts. And now it looks like that. So notice again, with just a couple tweaks, we're taking that very basic style sheet. Oh, I'm sorry, a very basic web page, and sort of pushing it in the direction of looking more like a, uh, a finished, completed web page. Why do we have, by the way, why did I specify three fonts for font family there? Exactly. Because different computers have different fonts installed on them. All right? For example, um, Arial is not on Mac. Helvetica is not on PCs, typically. And the sans serif is a generic font that sort of is the wild card of none of the above. All right, and we'll talk more about this later on when we talk about fonts. Where do you find all these things? I'm just throwing these things out, you know, font family, font size. Well, it's because I've worked on them for a long time, and I remember a lot of the common ones. But believe it or not, <clears throat> I don't remember all of them. So, that's where the resources come in. If you remember, the first assignment <clears throat> was for you to find a number of resources in, um, in, in several different topics. There's any number of them that you could find. One that's pretty good, 
not perfect. I've seen people criticize it, but for beginners especially, it's a pretty good resource. W3 uh, schools. And I can look up CSS, and I can look at <coughs> different things that I want. So how can I, for example, put a border around something? All right. And it gives me some examples. Let's look at this one. I could specify on a paragraph I want a border, five pixels, solid red. So let's go and let's do something similar to that. Except we'll do it on the header. Border. Three pixel. Solid black. We go and save that, and we get that. Let's put a white border around the nav. Now, do keep in mind that I'm just trying to introduce some of the capabilities that you have with this. It's not meant for you to memorize everything I do in class. The better thing to, to, to focus on is the fact that all of these style rules look the same. We start out with a selector that says this is what gets this style rule. The links get it. The, the last one. The links get it. The navigation section gets it. The header section gets it. The body section gets it. All right. Each rule consists of the name of the rule, the name of the thing that we're changing, a colon, and then the value. So in this case, I'm putting a border that's three pixels solid white around the navigation section. And there we go. So you can use resources like W3Schools. Well, then, then instead of three pixels, you'd make five pixels or something like that. Pixels is how many dots on the screen. So if I say, let's make it really big, 30 pixels. There, I have a giant border around each of them. Yes? Well, you save the web page as .html, you'd save the, the CSS as .css, and then you'd have the link to go and put it, um, apply the, um, apply the um, style sheet to the HTML. So I don't put it into the Well, you, you can, but what we talked about um, in last class is putting it in its own file, and in that way you can share it between a bunch of different pages. All right. So I can tell you know after class I can take a look at it and see what's going on. One thing that happens, is let's say for example, and this might be something that you're running in. Here's something I see 20 times per semester. So if it happens to you and I find it, I look brilliant, right? But really it's just that I've seen it a bunch of times. Something like that. If if you misspell background, for example. Notice we don't get anything. Why? Because, well, it, it doesn't know what to do with background. And therefore, it doesn't do that part of the rule. Or, if I, let's say, forget this curly bracket here. All right. It's like part of the style sheet applies, but part of it doesn't. This is sort of like with HTML. Remember we talked about HTML that if you have an error in your HTML, it's going to try to display the page the way it thinks that it needs to display it. All right? And it might be able to get it right anyhow, depending on the kind of error that you make. Like in some cases, the error that you make is not so bad that it, it blows up the whole page. But in other cases, 
the error that you make confuses the browser and it displays it way off, way incorrect. So same idea here in CSS. If you break one of the rules, all right, who knows what's going to end up. It, the browser tries to get it right, but who knows. All right. Okay. Let's talk about images now. All right. Let's go and let's pick up. Let's go out on the web and we'll search for Cleveland Browns. Oh, we got to do this guy. I'm going to save link as. No, not that. Save image as. And I'll save it in. in here and it's called that. I'm going to rename it to Brownie. And I'm going to cite where I got it from. So it's clevelandscene.com. Let's just remember that. And I'm going to put it on the home page. So I'll go in and I'll put, I could put it really anywhere. Let's put it here. IMG source equals, what's the name of this file? Brownie. But the full name of it is brownie.gif. All right, G-I-F. That's where it's important to, um, specify uh, the full name of the file. So I'll go here and put it in brownie.gif. And I'll say alt equals, because I want my alt, I want my alt attribute, Cleveland Browns mascot. All right, I go and save this, and I look at the, go to the home page, and there we get that. Now, notice a couple of things. Notice that the back of the image matches the background of the page. In fact, if I were to make the background of the nav section black the background of the image is now black. That's because this image has a transparent background. That's one thing that you can do with GIF files that you can't do with JPEG files. There's no transparencies associated with JPEG files. So the nice thing about this image is, is I can put it anywhere I want to and whatever color I chose to make the background will show through. All right. PNG files also support transparency. JPEG files do not. GIF files are typically good for drawings like this where you have a limited number of colors. All right, let's say I look at this and I say, well, that's kind of cute, but that's a little big. Let's, let's make a smaller version of this. What do you do? Well, I could put attributes on the image to make it smaller, but it's generally better to actually go in and edit the image itself. All right, the reason for that is because if you make, if you use HTML or CSS attributes to make the image smaller, then you're still downloading the big image. You might only be displaying it like a posted stamp, but you're still downloading all the bytes as part of it. 
Now one thing that's important is to make a copy of the image first. Make a copy of the original. So I'm going to put a copy of it on the desktop just so that um, if something goes wrong, then I can, I can still handle it. As far as sizing an image goes, a couple important things. First of all, you can make an image smaller and that's fine. There won't be a substantial drop in quality. I mean, it'll be smaller, but it should be as sharp as it was before. You can't, however, make an image bigger. It will lose sharpness. And that's one of the reasons you make a copy. So let's go into... These aren't vectors, though, are they? All right, so that's irrelevant. Would you consider them images? Would I consider what images? Vectors. Yeah, but they're totally irrelevant to what we're talking about now. Okay. You don't use vectors for image tags in HTML. All right. So I'm going to go in and open this guy with paint. All right. Interesting, it doesn't look like paint can handle the transparency. So let's see if there's another editing program here. Yeah, still paint. I can go in here and I can I have not used paint in so long that I'm having a hard time finding it. Tools. I'm looking for the resizing. Oh, resize. Yeah. Okay. So I can go here and I'm going to make it smaller. So let's make it a quarter of its original size. One thing that's important is that you maintain aspect ratio. Because if you don't, you can stretch out and make it distort the original image. So I'm going to make it a quarter of its original size. And I'll go and save it. And now when I go and view this, all right, I get that. I get a smaller image. All right. Paint being a not a very sophisticated uh, editing tool got rid of my transparent background and replaced it with a bla uh, black background. All right. Um, there are much better tools that you can use and you can download for free to do image manipulation. I don't really care what you use, but you should be familiar with something, if not for no other reason, to be able to do some simple resizing of your images. You can also crop. And by crop, you can go and if you don't want the whole brownie, maybe you just want part of the brownie, I can go here and crop and save and then I only get part of it. Minimally, you should know how to crop and resize images all right, in some photo editor. And I don't care really what photo editor you use. All right. Now, as I said before, if I go and save this, I can make it, always make it smaller. However, I'm going to make it bigger again. Notice how it becomes blurred. Notice how these lines, which originally were sharp, sort of become jagged. That's because when you make the image smaller, effectively you've lost some information. And therefore, that information you're not getting back. All right? So, I can go close this.
All right. And there we have our, our little brownie. All right, down there. The next thing I want to do is make the brownie a background image on things. All right. And I'm going to rename this guy to Big Brownie because it's the bigger image. And I'll go and drag it in here. And in the background, I can specify, in addition to a color, I can specify an image. And I specify the image this way. BigBrownie.gif. All right. And I can save it. And now when we look at this, we get that in the background. Now, we don't see it, right, behind these things. Why? Because we've specified a background for those. So I could go and do this, and I could get rid of the background on the header, and get rid of the background on the nav. And then we see the brownie poking through. Now the obvious, and again, we could get rid of the borders as well with this. Or at least make them smaller. And let's get rid of the small image for good measure. Now the problem with background images, as you can see here, is the way we had it first was probably the best, right? Because the way we had it first, we had the background image, but we had like stuff on top of it so that you could read it. We had colors on top of it. Here the problem is, is with this particular image, we can't read either, we can't completely read either white or black font. Alright? Now I could do things like maybe make it orange, so I could read the orange up here, the orange up here, but even, even there, the orange of the guy's coat is going to interfere. It's very difficult getting the right color mix with background images, because Images typically have a range of colors, so it's difficult to like, figure out what font to use. Now, one thing that you can do, and again, I'm not sure if paint does this or not, but you can go in I don't see how to do it with this. But you can go in and with other image editing tools, you can go in and change the contrast to sort of fade the image. Um, we don't have, I don't have the software to do that here. But essentially, you change the brightness and contrast of it. And then you can go and do that. What I'm going to do, and I'll do this while I'm talking about this, is I'm going to look for a free open source application called the GIMP, which is used for photo editing. Yeah, so do I. Um, depending on how the internet is working today. It may take longer or shorter to download, but I'm going to try to download it today so I can show you what I mean. I'm not optimistic watching the screen at this point. All right.
always downloading it via torrent. I'm sure I don't have a torrent client here. Yeah, I know, and I was legitimately downloading something via, or trying to download something via torrent the other day, and it wasn't letting me, so that kind of annoyed me. You can also follow this link. There we go. While we're doing that, I can put on the home page a disclaimer, and I'll do it in the footer because that's a good place as any. Image from Cleveland scene. All right, it's going to take forever. Um, how many of you have used some form of image editing program before? Okay. Um, that, this might be something that we can look at in lab um, because, again, uh, I, I think in lab there are, there's a bigger variety. The GIMP is probably already installed, and, and we can try that. Yes? What if you all want only one brownie? Excellent question. Well, let's see what our source says. CSS backgrounds, background color, background image, background repeat. I can repeat vertically. I can, re re I can repeat horizontally, vertically, or I can say no repeat. So I can go and say background no repeat. And then I can go and open it up. And we only have the one brownie. All right, I'm going to fix the colors and by making them a shade of orange. With HTML5, you can do animations, correct. Uh, I'm not really sure if that's relevant in this regard, but yeah, you can put, with HTML5, there's, there's um, code to do animations. All right, that's a little bit better, but again, the, the difference uh, between that isn't really conducive to this. What I could do is... I can give a color too. So I can say background brown, URL brownie. All right. Still doesn't look like brown to me. Um, and again, the text is kind of hard to read. And that's really the problem with background images. That's why a lot of the times when you use a background image, you will also put a color on the element so you're not writing directly on top of the image, you're writing on top uh, of the color. Um, so let me go back and do that. Background orange, color white. 
Um, All right, well, his head's kind of blacked off. All right, let's look for another picture instead. Let's do this one. I'll go and be sure to give credit where it's from. And I'll then change the style sheet to say <clears throat> Cleveland Brown JPEG. That's, that's moving in the right direction anyhow, all right, to where we can, we can see the background and uh, we can see that. We can still make some sort of sense of that. One thing you can also do, and this is a little bit advanced, is that you could um, make it so that the backgrounds to the orange and white section are somewhat transparent so that you can see the image sort of peeking out from underneath there. Uh, and again, that's something we'll discuss later on in the, in the term. Let me go in, let me make the color black here just to give a little bit of... Yeah, we're, we're moving in the right direction, I would say, for this page. All right. Now, if you remember back to some point we said that this didn't work in Internet Explorer. All right. Well, it sort of works. All right. Why is that? Because we're using a old version of Internet Explorer that doesn't understand HTML5. Well, what do you do? Well, you have two choices. <clears throat> One is you could go around to every place in the world that has a computer and check and make sure that they've updated to the newest version of Internet Explorer. All right? I have a feeling we better go for plan B, right? Because plan A doesn't sound very good. Plan A, uh, B rather, is that we have to somehow figure out a way to accommodate it. All right? Remember, browser compatibility issues are your responsibility to fix. You know, you can't, you know, one of the things that drives me crazy, and you don't really see it that much anymore, you used to see it, but where it says it's best to use Firefox for this website, it's best to use Internet Explorer, that in my mind is, is the mark of an amateur. All right? You're a web developer, you're putting your stuff out for the world, therefore, whatever browser someone has, if it's a legit HTML browser, they should be able to view your page correctly. Fortunately, someone did the work for us, and all we have to do is put it in. If we do a Google and look for HTML5 shiv, We can 
download this file. This is talked about in your textbook too, by the way. Then all we have to do is put a link to it in our code. And then, like magic, it works in HTML5. Uh, I mean, it works in Internet Explorer. What does this do? What this does is, effectively, it teaches Internet Explorer how to handle certain, not all, but certain HTML5 tags. Like the main new ones, like article and header and footer and so on. Yes? It will work, this, work, this is exclusively an Internet Explorer fix. Okay. For other versions of browsers, there's a little Firefox fix file. All right, an alliteration there. And we'll look at that next time. It is in your book. But if you put those two snippets of code in there, you'll handle most of the old browsers, and you should be in good shape. Probably doesn't work No. Again, all this does is it teaches the HTML, uh, teaches the browser how to understand the basic new HTML structural tags, like header, uh, footer, nav, section, and so on. So, that's how we can fix it to put it in there. The important lesson here is that it's your job to make sure your, your page is as browser compliant as possible. You need to test it to verify it. So you should open it up in several different browsers to, uh, to test that. All right? And um, if it doesn't work, it's your responsibility to alter the code to accommodate that. All right? Um, and this is one way that we can, we can do that. So, you know, you should be testing your, your pages for cross-browser compatibility. Any questions at this point? All right. We will write, first off on Monday of next week, we'll put the Firefox fix in there. And then I believe we're going to start to talk about your project. So before Monday, be sure you have read through the, the assignment for the project so that you can come to class with any questions and, and we'll go from there. All right, time for lab.